Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Purple Pill Philosophy is interviewing the legendary pop scholar Michael Heiser. How are you lately? Good. I, I didn't know I was legendary. <laughs> <laughs> Am I really that old? <laughs> Uh, I hope my kids don't listen to this. So, <laughs> uh, Tell the dear audience about yourself. Well, um, for the last 15 years, almost 15 years, I was the scholar in residence at Faith Life Corporation, the other makers of Logos Bible Software. Uh, it's in Bellingham, Washington. I still live in the state of Washington, but we're going to be moving to Jacksonville soon in a few months where I'm going to be the executive director of a new school that's both physical and distance, uh, Awakening School of Theology, it's called. So it's the first year is going to focus on my content, for lack of a better term. And the second year is just kind of whatever I care about. Um, it, it's, it's really for anybody in the world who just wants two years of you know, biblical theological education. We're not going to pursue accreditation deliberately. We're not interested in that. We're more interested in the the non-specialist, you know, the just the person in the local church who's going to be doing ministry to get a better handle on biblical theology and a whole assortment of topics um, without, you know, costing them 100K. <laughs> I mean, something has to be done here. So we're going to jump into that. Uh, before Faith Life, uh, I, you know, I've, I've taught for about 20 years on the Green Campus and Distance Ed for, I don't know, half a dozen different institutions, um, religious, you know, Catholic school, evangelical school, secular university. So I've taught a lot, published a lot. I, you know, I've published peer-reviewed journal articles, you know, several books. I do a lot of writing for the, uh, again, the popular audience as well. So I'm kind of all over the place. I have a YouTube channel that focuses on sort of responses to fringe beliefs, uh, you know, things like ancient aliens. I mean, I've always been into, you know, pop culture stuff. So I do that. I do a couple podcasts. Naked Bible Podcast is the big one. We we just, we crossed 6 million downloads this year. Oh, cool. So that that's that's in the total, you know, of the I think it's what, four or five years or something like that. So that's biblical studies. I have a peer a normal podcast where we do peer we go through peer reviewed literature on topics that would go under the paranormal label. I write fiction too. I mean, like I just you can find me in a lot of places. Um, I like anything old and weird. I always have, and uh, biblical studies is you know the wheelhouse. That's where my training is and. And professionally, you know, what I've done, but I'm in all sorts of places. Interesting. One of the main topics in the unseen realm, which is what we're interviewing about you about tonight, mm -hmm. is the use of literary polemic by the biblical authors. Like, mm -hmm. of course, uh, Bible bashers who don't know any better will see how similar in many instances in the Old Testament are to stories right. and myths outside the Bible, like yeah. in other. Near Eastern sources and go along with the caricature that the Israelites were these stupid Bronze Age sheep herders that had no original <laughs> ideas of their own, and then make the non right. they make the non sequitur that Yahweh is contrived a Canaanite storm god because it was said oh. to have created the world exactly the way the Egyptian and Babylonian gods did, flooded the world as the Mesopotamian gods did, and battled the chaos dragon as a certain champion god did in each pantheon so mm -hmm. yeah because it, it, because if we were writing polemic we would want to make it sound as dissimilar to the thing we're shooting at as possible right <laughs> i mean how would it be a polemic then <laughs> yeah <laughs> how would anybody know that's the most cleverly disguised polemic that's ever been produced yeah you know it's you're, you're right it's 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 kind of an absurd set of assumptions. You know, these people are living in the same place, you know, regionally. Um, the, the, the notion that they, they could all be writing about, you know, uh, a recollected event doesn't seem to occur to some of these, you know, Bible bashers, as you referred to them. Uh, and even if it did, if you're writing a polemic, if you're writing against someone's worldview or someone's theology, of course you're going to dip into it because the people you want to get the message would never get the message if you're writing about something altogether different. 
and you weren't using their material. Uh, this is like the most normal thing in the world. If, if you want to you know, write something that addresses a specific something else, well, the people who are reading it have to be able to tell that that's what you're doing. You know, it also sort of presumes that texts and beliefs are the same and coterminous. They are not. In other words, a people, Israelites will just say, can believe something for centuries, for millennia, before ever writing it down. You know, they, they could pass it on orally. I mean, oral culture is a big deal in, in the ancient world. So the idea that they didn't believe something until we, we have a text for something is just, again, pardon the expression, it's just boneheaded. You know, it, 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 it just fails to make this basic distinction. Now, I understand that's an easy thing to forget because, you know, we, we try to deal with primary source data. And, and, and the primary source data that exists for us is stuff that was written. I mean, I get it. That's just a reflex. You go to the text. Uh, I'm a text guy, so I understand that. But people have to realize that, hey, when, when the guy sat down and when he, when, he, when he took a seat on his butt and he started writing something with a pen, that isn't the first time he had a thought. It's also not the first time his people had a thought. It's not, and, and his ancestors, you know, were not people who had no thoughts prior to that event. I mean, these, these are the simplest, most obvious things in the world, but somehow they tend to escape critics, again, especially amateur critics, but they, they'll even escape, you know, scholars, because again, we're, we're sort of riveted. We get this little kind of myopic, you know, tunnel vision here on the text, and we, we kind of forget that, well, we can't really make statements about a, a people's intellectual, you know, repository and, and, and have that be coterminous with texts. Thinking and writing are two different things. One came after the other. You know, it, it just, again, it, it's very obvious when you think about it, but a lot of people don't think about it. So I would ask, hey, please, could you think about that before, you know, criticizing too much? Yeah, and also given the notion that the Old Testament relays like <clears throat> unscientific things back then that we know are wrong, like there comes the non sequitur that they were wrong about God as well. Right, right. Because, you know, l let's put it in religious terms, because this is what, what people are usually shooting at. So they'll take somebody who believes that God is behind uh, the Bible, you know, that, that God is the, the ultimate point of origin for this. Nobody I know believes that God was the immediate point of origin, like humans didn't write the stuff. I mean, this is not an X-Files episode, okay? <laughs> you know, the, the Bible is not a channeled book, and it never claims to be a channeled book. God used people. And if those people that God chooses aren't giving us science that would satisfy a 20th and 21st century audience, well— that might tell us that the God who prompted those people to write wasn't really interested in that. Because if he's a deity, he probably could have picked somebody better or waited to the 20th or 21st century to accomplish that if that was his purpose. So since that doesn't get accomplished, the logical thought would be, well, he probably had something else in mind that wasn't concerned with science. Again, when, when you actually stop to think about what the assumptions are, Again, we're assuming, you know, God for the sake of the conversation here, if God is behind this and, and God is providentially preparing people to write and moving them to get this or that down or putting them in the right time and place so that they'll, they'll produce this thing that he's going to use later on in somebody else's life. If, you know, you, you, you string all those things together and they extend just from the simple thought of theism, what, you know, what's more coherent, God exists or he doesn't, you know, that's the beginning point for all this stuff. So if you're going to if you're going to concatenate those things and then something that's produced doesn't satisfy a modern worldview again the logical conclusion wouldn't be that the deity forgot something or or did a boo boo okay the, the logical conclusion would be well that probably wasn't even in the picture probably didn't care and so again that that's actually my view so i i i, I kind of get a kick out of people who criticize the Bible for not being what it wasn't supposed to be. 
you know, and I'll ask them, what do you get mad at your dog for not being a cat? Do you get mad at your son for not being a daughter? I mean, if you can explain how your method, how your approach makes any sense, then, you know, we can have a discussion about that. Um, it, but it, it, the approach doesn't make any sense to me. And so I tend to be critical of the approach back at the approach, you know, for, for those reasons. Yeah. The main verses behind the theme of Unseen Realm are Psalm 82 and Deut Deuteronomy 32, yet... Most mainstream scholars, such as Mark S. Smith, John Day, William Deaver, Pete Enns, and many others, hold that these verses mean something different than you and other scholars like Richard Elliott Friedman and Richard Hess do. Mm -hmm. like, and, and, right and by the way, Friedman and Hess are also mainstream scholars, so I am not out of the mainstream, but I know what you mean. Like uh, Deuteronomy 32, originally meaning that Yahweh was originally a minor desert god that was given territory by the Most High, incidentally El, and Psalm 82 having Yahweh in the role of Baal in the Baal cycle, when he rises up and challenges the gods, like, I think Anderson did a peer-reviewed article on it. The Christian and Jewish scholars among them are, of course, just relaying what they believed the Israelites back then thought, not what is actually the case. Mm -hmm. I would say for your audience, if if your audience wants sort of a a place to go online, you know, for for my thoughts on this in more detail, they should go to Google and Google drmsh.com, and then the keywords Psalm eighty two monotheism and archive. I, I've created a page where I archive the, my papers on this that are you know published but you can still access them online for free. Let, let me just say, you know, since you, you threw Pete Enns into the mix here, um, in theory, I don't have a problem with the notion that God could have told biblical writers or led biblical writers to certain thoughts about himself in stages. In other words, the I, I think it's a myth on the other side. And I think this would... You know, I, I don't know if Pete's shooting at this or not, but I, you know, I, I think some scholars could shoot at this, so I'm going to bring it up. Um, the notion that the biblical writers all had the same thoughts about God all at the same time, or that over time they, they never could have changed. I think that's a myth. I mean, God certainly could have told them a little bit here, and then later on a little bit more, corrected this or that, you know, because other doctrines develop through scripture kingdom of god is a real obvious one but but there are a number of things that, that develop over time so in principle I'm, I'm not opposed to that my problem with it is that i don't think it makes sense because of the data and i think a lot of the arguments uh promoting the evolutionary trajectory simply do not make sense and are, and are actually easily contradicted by data um let, let me just give you some examples here you know you one th there's an assumption that Elohim, plural, plural Elohim. Mm -hmm. Elohim is a Hebrew term that's often, I mean, most of the time used for the God of Israel. It's sort of a generic, becomes a generic term, but it can also be plural, gods, you know, put an S on the end of it. Well, there's an assumption that, hey, in passages where we, it should be translated plural, that shows polytheism. And you ask, well, why? Well, it's because it, they're gods there. Uh, okay, Um why is it then that, you know, biblical writers would use the same term Elohim of the disembodied dead in 1 Samuel 28, 13? Or they, they use the, the, the term, you know, in the plural for, you know, the gods of the nations while they're saying Yahweh is the God Elohim of all Elohim. That tells you that the biblical writers aren't using the term to state an ontology. Okay, because they would they, they would be hopelessly muddled in their thinking. It tells you that they're not the inter the Elohim aren't all the same. They're not just interchangeable, and in fact, the biblical writers take great pains to deny certain attributes to other Elohim. Again, Elohim has nothing to do with a set of specific attributes, but since that's the way we think about the letters G O and D in modern times, we assume that biblical writers thought the same way about the word Elohim. See, when we see the letters G, O, and D on a page or on a screen, because we're Western, because we have, we're part of the Judeo-Christian tradition, 
our, our brains just default to, oh, G, O, and D, that's omniscience, eternality, omnipotence, omnipresence, you know, all these, this string of attributes. And so when you put an S on it, it creeps people out. Well, you know, that, that, that's, we can't have that. But we assume, again, that the biblical writer is using Elohim and thinking the same way about that term when they're not. And how do we know? Well, it's because of the way they use it. You know, so, so this is why in, in my writing I say something, look, it, this notion that Elohim has something to do with a unique set of attributes, and therefore when it's plural we have polytheism, there's something wrong with that. Because it, 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 it leads us to absurd conclusions, like, like a biblical writer would have thought that his dead infant, who's now part of the disembodied spiritual world, is on the ontological level with Baal or, or Yahweh. That, that's ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe that. There's no proof for anybody thinking in these terms, but they're all Elohim. So there goes, no, no, let's try to think a little bit better about the term. All the, all the term means, you would use Elohim as a biblical writer to describe any entity, any resident of the disembodied spiritual world, regardless of their ontology or regardless of their, where they are in the hierarchy. Elohim is like a synonym for ruchot, spirits, spirit beings. Okay, that, that's what it is. So that, that's one problem, you know, and they're, they're just a, a number of these, you know, like in my, in my, a year ago, we had our first Naked Bible conference and, and I, uh, that's the name of my podcast, Naked Bible podcast. Hmm. And so I did a presentation on the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls in, in regard to this assumption, because you'll read in literature, scholarly literature that, well, when we get to the second temple period that's the intertestamental period you know especially the hellenistic era the biblical writers are are you know they don't want to see other gods okay because they've evolved to monotheism now and the gods the other gods are dead or they want them to be dead or gosh they hope they're dead or something like that and so so now they're talk about angels instead of gods well the septuagint translators sorry they didn't get the memo because if you actually look at all the places where how all the places where the Septuagint translators have to render Elohim, you know, they go from Hebrew Elohim to Greek, there's only three or four of those instances where you don't have theoi or, or some plural of theos, gods. So they, they, they don't have any trouble having gods in the Hellenistic era in, in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. It's the same thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are, there are 180, I know because I counted them. This is part of my dissertation. <laughs> there are 180 or, or a little bit more instances of Elohim in the plural in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And 15 or 20 of those are specifically in divine council passages, you know, this, these quote-unquote pantheon passages. Now, I've got news for you. The very same language that supposedly before the exile that Israelites, you know, they, were, they were polytheists, and then by the time they emerged from the exile, they've, they've achieved the, the, the breakthrough of monotheism, and they're denying all these other gods exist. Well, the very same terminology that's in pre-exilic texts is in post-exilic texts, word for word, phrase for phrase, and it's about six or seven times more. Okay, and so, so how does the evolutionary trajectory conform to those data? That's what I want to know. Okay, but, but nobody ever like looks. I, I can point you to articles, and I do this in my published articles, where I'm not going to give the person's name here. People can go, go get the article. It's the one on the Tyndale Bulletin on the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? There are scholars who will, who will articulate this idea that, that we've transitioned from Elohim to angels, and they'll be quoting Dead Sea Scroll text, and they'll quote five or six texts in the article. If you look at the text, the word for angel never appears, it's still the plural word for gods, Elohim and Elim. The word for angel, Malach or Malachim, doesn't even appear in the text. But they're making an argument for this transition and quoting texts that don't even represent what they're saying. Now you say, how can they do that? It's because they've just been taught the paradigm. Nobody questions it. You know, I mean, I, I could just go on and on with this. Uh, to be fair to you, your audience, you know, this is my dissertation, so I kind of swim here. 
you know, okay, Psalm 82, you know, or let's Deuteronomy 32, you know, L giving Yahweh a piece of turf. Well, that's wonderful until you do two things. Until you look at Deuteronomy 4, 19 through 20, which everyone in the literature knows is the parallel to Deuteronomy 32, 8. It says, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted. There's the language, you know, from Deuteronomy 32, 8. Mm-hmm. He's allotted them to all the peoples under the whole heaven, but Yahweh, the Lord, has taken you. He doesn't get it like, oh, thank you. Thank you, El. Thanks for this little piece of land. No, he takes it as his own. So that language doesn't reflect there. And if you go back to Deuteronomy 32 and verses 6 and 7, guess what? We have El and Baal epithets attributed to the lone Yahweh in the two verses prior. So the question is, if, we're, if we have polytheism in verse 8, why is the polytheism messed up in verses 6 and 7 <laughs> like when they're they are... identifying the two with the one? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. The, and and are... scholars, go ahead. It's argued that 32.8 was reflecting an older tradition. Oh, of course, because, because everybody listen out there, sit down. If you're driving, roll, you know, turn off to the side of the road, okay? Because we all know that manuscripts come with dates on them don't we? No, we don't. It's a guess. It's an assumption that is brought to the text as to when a manuscript variant, this difference, happened. You have to impose a chronology on the texts and then argue after your imposition of your chronology to that conclusion. And all I'm saying is, look, You can't, there's no way to know when these changes happen. And you know what? It wouldn't matter if it was older, because I'm arguing on the basis of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, all this other stuff, that on both sides of the chronology, you get the same phrases. Again, there's no, there's no idea that the Septuagint translation is pre-exilic. Nobody in there, unless they occupy an insane asylum, would say that, okay? We know when the Septuagint was translated, and they are perfectly free to use plural Elohim, B'nai Elohim, the phrases of Deuteronomy 32.8 in that late material, and the Dead Sea Scrolls are even later than that. So it is a, I mean, i got to be blunt, it's a lame argument to, to just move that back as though it means something. It, it's not a meaningful statement, because the same language shows up exponentially more often after this you know evolution to monotheism has supposedly taken place you know and and i i I know that i'm you know i i'm in the minority here because i did my dissertation on this at a secular university my advisor was jewish but to his credit you know, he, he found the topic interesting, even though it, it ran contrary, you know, to some fundamental things. But but my work here has passed peer review on a number of levels here. I'm not just making stuff up. I'm saying here are data that are not being thought about well, that are that are just sort of not even looked at. And in some cases, we're making claims that the data actually contradict. So we need to do a little bit better here. Now, I I would never argue something as silly as all Israelites, you know, believed in the lone Yahweh, the ontologically unique Yahweh. Of course they didn't. It's going to be like today. I mean, you you can't even get Christians to, you know, people who would call themselves Christians, you can't even get them to agree on Trinitarian articulation. Even even the groups that, that claim a Trinity will talk about it differently Eastern Orthodox versus like evangelical or something like that. And then you'll have Christians who are oneness Pentecostals. You can't even get people to agree now on really fundamental things. So of course, in the ancient world, it's not monolithic, but my argument is the biblical writers, and and we're looking at their material. This is the text. The text as we have it taken in its, in, in context with all this other data, does not justify this evolutionary perspective. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. It's based upon semantic misunderstanding 
and in some cases exclusion of data, and in other cases just really kind of poor thinking about data. While we're on that topic, uh, do you hold that Yahweh and El are different versions of the same Almighty God that were seen as distinct by many Israelites, like given the anti-El polemic we see in Hosea, as Chalmers argues? Or is the latter a more perverted version of the former, or well, is it you more can, complicated than that? You can have both, because you can have the biblical writers saying, look, we're trying to produce this, this thing that people later are going to call the Hebrew Bible to make the point to you Israelites out there that this El and Baal thing from Canaan, we're not doing that. I mean, I have a whole published article on, and this is drawn from my dissertation, on the, on the divine council co-regency structure from Canaan to Israel. And in Canaan, you had El and Baal, one and two, all right? Regent, co-regent. In the, in the Hebrew Bible, you also have two structures, regent and co-regent, but they're both occupied by Yahweh figures. One is the transcendent, invisible Yahweh. The other one is the visible Yahweh, the one that appears as a man. So what, what, I, what my argument is, is that the biblical writers are, are, are essentially adapting or you know, coming up with their own version of a king co-regent structure that would have been known from the ancient world, just sort of across the board, really. But they're, they're, they're looking at the spiritual world this way, but they're, they're rejecting the notion of two separate deities, El and Baal, running the show. And for them, it's Yahweh, in, in essentially two Yahwehs. The, Yahweh occupies both slots. And this is the beginning. This is, this, this is the, the kernel, you know, source you know, point of origin for what would later develop in Judaism as the two powers in heaven idea. Right. That used the, to be part angel, of Jewish theology. Right, the yeah, angel yeah. of the Lord being the second Yahweh. Right, there, there's all sorts of ways that I think this this regent and co-regent structure are, are conveyed. And so you could have somebody, you could have a biblical writer trying to articulate a point of that, and you could still have an anti-L epithet because they're trying to, to get people out of the Canaanite pantheon structure thing. They're, they're, they, they don't want them going down that road because it affirms two separate deities. And they're trying to get them to think a different way about, you know, who runs the heavens, who runs the show. You know, and, and it sounds, I mean, to a Christian, it doesn't sound so weird because Christians have this, this concept of a Godhead. But, but you think, well, the Israelites wouldn't have been thinking that way. Well, yeah, they, they actually really could. And it's not just Mike. I mean, after my dissertation was done, after I'm out a few years, Benjamin Summer at, you know, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, I mean, he's not a Christian or an evangelical, he's, he's Jewish, okay? He's a rabbinic scholar, ancient Near Eastern scholar. He came out with a book called Bodies of God. And, and if there's Christians in your audience, you're going to have to forgive Summer because he'll, if you read his book, he's going to sound like a modalist sometimes, but he's not sensitive to the way, you know, to the Christian debates on how to talk about the Godhead are. So, so cut him a break. But he says point blank in his books that the idea of a Godhead, specifically a Trinitarian Godhead, are com is completely compatible with the Hebrew Bible. Now, you cannot make a statement like that, A, and not know the data, and B, think like this, this evolutionary trajectory thing. It's not consistent. So, you know, I, I don't think the biblical writers are, are like, coming up with a new deity and they're smashing the other two together. I think it is more complicated than that. I think they're trying to, to help people, uh, help the Israelites focus on the, the one God of Israel, but yet they're, they're, again, I don't know, you know, cause I wasn't there either. I don't know if the right word is adapting or again, presenting the, a similar idea in a different way or, or what, I don't know what the right vocabulary is for that, but they want people to affirm that there's there's only one deity in charge of everything. He could be a regent and co-regent. He could be two persons because you're going to have passages where the invisible Yahweh and the visible Yahweh are present at the same time and yet distinguished. Okay, there, there's, there is this talk in the Hebrew Bible. There really is. You know, the, 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 the Jewish community for, for four or five centuries in the Second Temple period who felt very free to debate the, on the identity of the second Yahweh figure, they're getting that from somewhere, and they're getting it from their Hebrew Bible. They're not just making it up. 
Okay, it is in the Hebrew Bible. It's just that a lot of Jews, I would say 99% of Jews today, don't know about it because it was declared a heresy later in the 2nd century AD, which again, I don't think is coincidental. That coincides with the birth of you know, the, the Jesus movement, you know, or, you know, the early church. And, and, and I don't mean to sound like it's anything sinister. The, the Jewish community there is doing what, what you would expect them to do. They're circling the wagons. They're trying to keep people from becoming Christians because the Christians are just saying, look, we know who the second Yahweh figure is, you know, the, the one that came as a man in the Old Testament. Well, he really came as a man this time because of the incarnation. It's this Jesus guy. You know, I mean, they're, they're going down the whole road and they're just they're proposing Jesus of Nazareth as the, a new candidate for the second power. You know, and that's just too much, you know, for the for the Jewish community. It's 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 a big element in the parting of the ways. And so the Jewish community is taking steps to to just run this, you know, to, to try to prevent this leakage from their own community. So they declare the second power discussion a heresy. We don't want to hear about it anymore. They, they forbid their community from reading the Septuagint because there are certain passages in the Septuagint that would favor the Christians in, in this debate. And, and they take all of, their, of the texts of the Hebrew Bible and they come up, they decide to standardize them and they come up with the Masoretic text that's going to be the, the text of the Jewish community from there on out. About 100 AD, you know, the, it, they're they're doing things that are logical, but few in the Jewish community even know that, and frankly, the Christian community even know that this transition actually occurred. And and they're, my point is that look, the for four or five hundred years they're talking who's who's the the other Yahweh guy. And they're getting that from somewhere. And I think that that was the theology of the pre-Israelite biblical writers and the post-exilic, you know, the pre-exilic and the post-exilic biblical writers. I think it's consistent. You know, it, it, it does develop, but I think it's consistent. And so the text as we have it reflects that theology. I, I'm, my, my argument is that it does not reflect, and again, the, this is all, I'm saying this deliberately, it does not reflect a polytheistic belief system on the part of the biblical writers. The masses, you know, God only knows what they're believing because they don't have Bibles for one thing. They're just going to believe what they're told or what they're not told. They're just going to guess. They're going to wing it. You know, I mean, again, it's just like today. It's no different than today. It's never monolithic and it never will be or can be. And on a related note, what do you make of the theory that Yahweh merged with El, like in the case of Baal, like we see with battling the dragon god Leviathan and the divine warrior persona in general, like many compare that to the merging of Ra and Amun in Egypt, as well as Marduk and other deities in Babylon. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, Yahweh's sitting out there in the spiritual world saying, gosh, I need to merge with one of these other deities. You know, so I, I don't really like you know the the merging language. I don't I don't know if that's a good way to describe uh, it. What I do secret. know, right? What I do know is that the biblical writer wants his readers to to think, okay, here's this L story in my head floating around, and then there's here's this Baal story floating around in my head. I think the prophets and the biblical writers want people to know, you know, you know who's really in charge of this stuff that this one story has El in charge of, and this other story has Baal in charge of, you know who's really in charge of all of it? Yahweh. And so they put Yahweh in both boxes. Okay, that, that, that's the goal. That's the theological goal. So I don't know that, that using a term like, like merger or even syncretism is the right way to talk about that. Uh, again, all I think we can really do is describe the, the sort of the phenomena of the text that, that this is what they're trying to accomplish. And, and we, we ought not to try because we can't, to be honest with you, we can't psychologize the writers. We can't like, like know when you wrote this, this was, was the exact train of thought that led, led you to write that sentence. Okay. We, we can't really know that we, we can know that they wrote it. You know, and the effect of it is something we can judge. And so that's where I try to camp out. What does the text say? And, and what's the theological impact of what we have here? The theological impact is a co-regent structure that is like a co-regent structure of Canaan. And that's nothing unusual, by the way. I mean, every, every ancient Near Eastern civilization had an ordered spiritual world. 
I mean, you, they, in other words, they didn't have the gods like Keystone cops. All right. In the spiritual world, we would assume that if they're highly intelligent and if they're powerful, that they want and they accomplish order in their own world. They imposed kingship here. They, they want order here. So logically, they want order there. And so they, they make the, the simple set of you know, assumptions. And, you know, the, the, the metaphor that, that's used, there's a bunch of metaphors. For it. One of the main metaphors is this divine counsel, you know, thing, because that, that helps get the point across that the spiritual world is orderly. It gets the point across as to who's in charge. You know, it gets the point of cross, across as to, you know, the concept of rebellion and obedience, you know, all this kind of stuff. You, you need these things, you need to write these things in a way that people will understand because they can see kingship, they can see earthly authority, they can see all that. And so what they take away from it, you know, is, is, is what I'm really interested in. What's the impact of the phenomena of the text? Because we can all sit here and psychologize the writers, and at the end of the day, we don't have a prayer of knowing if anybody in the room is right, okay? Because we can't reproduce the things that were in their head that led up to the thing they wrote. All we've got is the thing they wrote. And again, we also can't impose a, a contrived chronology on the data. We don't know when a lot of this stuff was written in terms of chronological order. And, and so my objection is, the chronology that the critic, the critical scholars, for the most part, impose on the text, this evolutionary trajectory from polytheism to monotheism, it is so flatly contradicted by data that follow that it just doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, like nobody got the memo. You apparently get some criticism by a few uber liberal readers for your views on Israelite religions, such as Elohim, which you <clears throat> take to mean a generic term for spirit beings like you don't necessarily buy the idea that the israelites viewed the spirits of the dead ancestors and prophets like enoch melchizedek moses samuel and elijah as gods like even in the second temple period or even angels as was the case in ugaritic and canaanite religion or poly I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure i'm following the question <laughs> What like um, what what am I not saying in the question? <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> these are long questions. Like you don't buy the idea that the Israelites viewed the spirits of dead ancestors and prophets, the above mentioned prophets, as gods. All right, okay, let's just stop there. You know, I, I don't I don't think uh, again. I don't think that the people writing the biblical text and the people reading the biblical text and, and again, assigning some importance and trying to have fidelity to it, I don't think they're sitting there thinking, hey, Grandpa is a god now. You know, I wonder if he's out there creating a world somewhere. You know, no, I don't believe they're, they're thinking that at all. I think the language is they do believe that their ancestors well, there's are still alive. They, they have a life of some other nature, some other place, you know, the underworld, the afterlife, whatever. So I, I do think it means as at least that, but I don't think they're like turning into superheroes or something. You also don't. That, that actually sounds a little bit like Mormonism. It does. It does. And I'm, I'm not a Mormon, so I feel free to reject that. <laughs> you, also, you, you also don't buy the idea that angels were gods, like in the, how the Ugaritic Canaanites believed. Yeah, well, the, the angel is a functional term. So, again, it, in my book, Angels, I spend the first chapter talking about semantics, which I think a lot of biblical scholars fail to do. I'm just going to be blunt with that. Um, there are, there are essentially three buckets. Okay. The biblical writers use terms here. This is the first bucket. There are terms that describe what a thing in the spiritual world is. Those are ontological terms, things like Ruchot, you know, like spirit or spirits. Elohim is, is a, you know, is a term that describes what a thing is. It's a spirit being. Okay. It doesn't really say anything about attributes or rank or hierarchy or roles or function or anything like that. It, it just, that's what it is. It's a spirit being. And then there are terms that 
describe rank in hierarchy, okay? Or some kind of, you know, administrative order. That's bucket number two. This is, these are council terms, divine assembly, and you know, all that kind of stuff, okay? And then the third bucket, I think, is the biggest one. And these are terms that describe function or role, what a thing does. So there's what a thing is, where a thing ranks, and what a thing does, okay? Three buckets. Angel is in the third bucket. It's a messenger. So in that sense, a malach, an angel, a messenger, is an Elohim, because the Elohim just means it's a spirit being. But it doesn't mean that they have the certain attributes of Yahweh or any other deity, because we have to look at the way those deities are described. We don't know, and, and frankly, in, in the Hebrew Bible's case, angels don't get certain attributes, certainly, that Yahweh possesses. And they wouldn't have the same level of power and ability, even in Ugaritic material. So, you know, that, that's like, depending on how your question is read, the answer could be yes or no. So I, I don't, I don't quite know what else to do with that, but we, we need to stop merging terms. We need to stop merging semantics of terminology because it creates confusion not only like in the early church and, and the average Christian, I mean, they, they, have, they have no feel. I mean, what, what, what church tradition does is it takes all the terms of the Bible and smashes them all together and calls it an angel. That's just not accurate. It's, it's just, it, it creates all sorts of confusion and tension between both the Old and the New Testament, to, to just be really frank about it. Um, it, it's why I can go to into a church, and if I just went in there and started talking about Elohim, the divine council, people are going to look at me like I got two heads, you know. And and I might hold the very same theology. I'm a standard Christian Trinitarian guy, okay. I hold the same theology this bunch does, and they're going to think I'm just sort some kind of wacko, because we're using the same terms, but we mean quite different things, and and that needs that needs to be addressed. And I, what what I in what I write, I try to address that, especially in the angels book, because, you know, everything's not an angel. That's just a job description. It's a job description that a particular member of the spiritual world has on any given day or whatever. It's all it is. It's a job description. It is not an ontological term. Like, and because well, you don't... Oh, I was going to say, well, of course not everything is angels, Politics is pretty much confirms that. <laughs> also, like, uh, in that case, everything's a demon. Or... <laughs> demons. Oh boy, there's a demon joke in there somewhere. But demons yeah. in office. <laughs> like in the, you also don't buy the idea of polytheist mo monolatry in general. Like, be because of this, you get accused of having religious conservative bias. Like. How did you come to your position and what are your biggest reasons against the consensus view among critical scholars? Yeah, yeah. Well, that, this is this is a good question because ter all these terms, monotheism, monolatry, polytheism, henotheism, they're all modern terms. So we have modern vocabulary that we're trying to impose on ancient texts and, and and we're assuming that we're capturing ancient thinking. Not really. I mean, there, there are disconnects. There are problems with all of them. You know, polytheism, again, as we use it, assumes that all of the gods, all of the Elohim are essentially interchangeable and have the same attributes. I don't think for a minute that a biblical writer thought that because of the way they use the term Elohim. Monolatry is better because then, then that says you should only worship one. Okay, so that much for sure is true. The question is, does monolatry address the distinction between the one, the ontological distinction between the one worshipped and the other ones? And the answer to that is no, it doesn't. Monolatry, by definition, concerns only which one, the one you're worshiping. It doesn't make any ontological statements. So it's better, but it's still inadequate. Henotheism suffers from the same problem. 
henotheism, the idea, again, that you got a bunch of, of gods and one of them, you know, s somehow either through a conquest or some nat nature event or whatever it is, in, you know, in an ancient culture, bubbles to the top and then that becomes the, the, the top deity. Well, I mean, you, you, could, you could look at the Hebrew Bible in, in some passages and think, oh, that, that looks like henotheism. But again, the, if you're a henotheist, you assume that, well, tomorrow or a hundred years from now, another deity might be the best one. And so the question is, did a biblical writer really think that? Did he think Yahweh was replaceable? Did he think Yahweh could be toppled by a, a, a deity that's equally powerful, equally you know, ha having equal attributes? Did he really think that? And my answer to that is no, they didn't think that. So again, henotheism is better than polytheism, but there are gaps in what it covers terminologically. And monotheism, again, is, is a difficult term. It's a modern term that really, if you read Nathan McDonald's treatment of this, it's Deuteronomy and the Meaning of Monotheism, he traces the monotheism as a term back into the 17th century. You know, so that's a difficult term because it assumes that there can only be one God that exists, at least in the way that we talk about monotheism. Because if we have other gods existing, that would be polytheism. Well, why do we think that way? It's because we think of the word of the letters G, O, and D as having something to do with a specific set of unique attributes. And it, that's the way we think. That is not the way a biblical writer thought about Elohim. So all four of these terms I don't like. Okay, they, and I, I don't like because they're bad. I don't like them because they're inadequate. So what I tell people is, look, rather, you, you got to try not to be a modern person here. Resist the impulse to stick a label on something. Instead of trying to come up with one word that's a good label for something, let's just describe what the biblical writers believed. And that's what I try to do in my books. I don't come up with another label because there really isn't a good one. So we're kind of stuck. And, and so my, again, if I were a little more, if I were cranky right now, I'd say, look, don't be lazy. Don't, don't look for a label. Just take a minute and describe what, what they, what the biblical writers would affirm and what they would deny. I mean, noodle that for a little bit and then try to describe it. Maybe, maybe come up with the elevator speech for that 30 seconds or a minute. You don't need a label. Labels are inadequate. And so that is why I land where I do. Not because, you know, I, took communion or something you know it just again I, I get these things thrown at me because that's the only way people can think and you know what I, I, even though i'm the target of some of that so you might think that's my problem it ain't my problem it's your problem okay the, the fact that that i'm coming to a conclusion you don't like doesn't excuse you from trying to actually understand why i get there Okay, because if, if all you're going to try to do is come up with a label or, you know, come up with some convenient explanation without actually listening and, and, and you know, noodling it with me a little bit, well, you know, I, I can't help you. I, I can't do that for you. So you need to do that yourself. And speaking of polytheism, this is this is kind of a joke to bring up in an interview with an actual scholar. But once in a while, uh, try me. <laughs> once, <laughs> once in a while, a village atheist or a neo pagan will bring up a couple of verses where God would otherwise look weak, such as Judges nine one nineteen with the iron chariots defeating the men of Judah, and Kings. Uh, Two three, where it would seem that the Lord lost a fight to Chemosh, as was told in the Mesha steel, where the Moabites defeated the Israelites and stole Yahweh's relics. Right, right. Like, so, and because because we all know that God had to deliver the Israelites in every circumstance, no matter what. Right. <laughs> it, they, uh, usually, they usually bring up the fact that there was a prophecy about them defeating Moab and that getting overturned by another god. Like, it, 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 doesn't, of, it doesn't matter in the least. Let, let, let's talk about Second, Second Kings 3, because they're missing two things, at least two things, maybe more. Let, let's just take the, the bigger issue of prophecy, which would basically take 
another hour long show to go through, but prophecies frequently, I, I don't know if it's fair to say that it's most of the time that might be an overstatement. There are actual studies on this that I, again, I don't have the studies memorized, but I, I, it, it may be, I mean, it's a, it's a significant amount. Let's just put it that way. I don't, I don't know what the percentages would break down here, but prophecies frequently come with conditions. And I'm not talking a simplistic conditional statement like if then. There are other things lurking in the Hebrew text or the context that create conditions for a prophecy. And in many, many cases, you know, again, the, you, you're, I think you use the term village atheist or something like that here. The village atheist will not even be aware to even look for this stuff. And, and, and you got to look beyond English. You know, there, again, there are actual studies on this conditionality and prophecy and whatnot. It, it's actually really interesting. But since that's the long, you know, analysis let's let's cut to the short one that's, like, that, case, that's, what, that's what that's what i call the angry atheists who don't come in yeah control. right you know do you really want to try to understand the issue or not or do you just want to spout something you know it, it's it's up to you so second kings 327 the the outcome of this moab the, the kimosh you know thing so the king of Moab, then he took his oldest son who was to reign in his place and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel. And they, the Israelites, withdrew from him and returned to their own land. Do you notice what the verse never says? We aren't told that the wrath comes from Chemosh, are we? That's read into the passage. Like the, like the deity, the Moabite deity is venting against Yahweh and Yahweh, oh, Yahweh's cringing in the corner. Oh, I give up. I give it. We're never, we, it's not in the text. We don't know who the wrath comes from. It could just as well come from the people or from the army. Maybe there were, you know, they were really ticked that the, the guy just killed his son. Maybe they liked the son. We don't even know how old the son is. Maybe he was popular. Maybe he was like a, a grown man and he's one of them. We don't know anything about the circumstance. Okay, second, the text doesn't say that Yahweh turned tail and ran. It says the Israelites turned tail in response to the wrath, whatever, whatever its source was. So here you have a bunch of Israelites who are supposed to believe. These are Israelites now. They're supposed to believe in their hearts that their God is the God of gods. The God who defeated the Egyptians at the Red Sea. And what do they do? Do they have faith? They, they even have a prophecy. Do they even believe it? Do they believe what God said? No, they don't. They just blink. And they turn tail and run. So why is it God's fault if he chooses not to deliver unbelief? I got news for you. God, God says in a lot of places, I'm not going to deliver you if you don't believe. This is a predictable result. You know, why does Yahweh get blamed for this as though he took a beating? There's no textual proof for it. And, and, and the, the, the counter to it is that he will, in some cases, even punish unbelief. It's like ignored. You it's, it's sort of get that idea from the, as, as was told in the Mesha Stele. Well, if, you know, of, of course it's going to be told that way in the Mesha Stele. Who's writing it? Moabites, you know, I mean, you know that Moabites aren't. Yeah, you know, let's reduce it to some really simple things. Question: Should we expect Moabites to do Israelite theology? In Absolutely not. Right? Of course not. Okay, Moabites are going to put the best spin possible on the event, and and they do. Isn't it interesting that the Hebrew Bible writers don't do that? The Hebrew Bible writers just say, our guys were chicken. <laughs> okay. They, just, they, they didn't believe and they took, you know, they turned tail and ran. I don't think we need to stress the ridiculousness and illogic and the implications they give, but I like to hear an actual scholar's take on this suggestion that the same God that parted the Sea of Reeds and was said to have battled Leviathan or any kind of God in general was thwarted by man's tools. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, and, you know, it's a good point. I, I want your, your audience, and I hope they're getting the impression here. Look, there's very little of what I have said in this interview that requires a PhD. I would say next to nothing. You know what's more important than a PhD? Clear thinking. 
Okay, asking good questions. Okay, you're not going to get a PhD for that, but it's really useful. It's really valuable. So, so don't get enamored with degrees and all. Okay, the guys with the PhDs, yes, we're, we are good for something. Okay, and that is data, ferreting out data. Yes, some questions are going to depend on, you know, the knowledge of the original languages. Absolutely. I didn't waste my time getting a PhD. That isn't what I'm saying here. What I am saying is that you don't need a PhD to think well. Okay, you cannot, you can do that on your own. And, and it's, it's my job. This is why I do my podcast. This is why I write the books. I think it's my job as a scholar to give you more nuts and bolts to think well about so that you, you know, not just sit there and entertain yourself by doing Bible study, but so that, that you, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, you got a lot more grist for the mill and, and, you know, go at it, you know, get, get busy doing it. Um, you know, I wish more scholars would, would do that. But please, you know, if you're in the audience, you, you should not be thinking that you've got to go out and get a degree. You, you just don't. <laughs> you just don't. Like, um, yeah, but what's your take on the, um, even though the people I deal with on a regular basis don't normally think about this stuff. Oh, I know. I'm curious as to, to a, I'm curious as to a scholar's take on the Iron Chariots debacle in Judges in 119. In which, which passage, Judges in, 119? Yeah. Let me see, let me just, I have my software open. Let me go to that. Oh, let's see. So the Lord was with Judah. He took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. So the question is, who's the antecedent? See. They like to imply that God was thwarted by man's tools, even though that makes no mm -hmm. sense in any context. Well, you know, well, the, the part of the problem is, okay, and, and here you go. Here we have a case where an English translation is going to say, and, and I, I, I would imagine most English translations would say this, but he could not drive out. Guess what? We don't have the word he in the original language. We don't even have a finite verb form, like a third masculine singular verb form. We instead have an infinitive, and we have to supply a subject to that. So it would be making, it would be overreaching the text to say that Yahweh is the subject of this verbal action. It's not a necessary conclusion in any way, not because of Mike's theology, but because of the text. You could just as well, you know, put it, make it an it. It could not drive out. Judah, Judah couldn't do it. Or they could not drive. You know, the subject in terms of the person and number is ambiguous because we have an infinitive form and infinitives do not have person and number. This is grammar. And I know, again, the village atheist is going to go... You know, oh, oh, what, you know, well, sorry, but the text is what it is. So don't make an argument that you think the text supports when it actually doesn't. Yeah, and like, um, not only does that does that not make any sense, like the idea that it was defeated by a minor god like Chemosh when the Egyptian pantheon was no problem for him, like. Best excuse I hear for this one is the Exodus never happened tangent, and Yahweh made a mockery out of Dagon on numerous occasions. Well, that's true. I mean, you know, God God can you know do what He wants, you know. But the the reverse, the, the flip side is also true. You know, God allows the He doesn't allow. He actually it depends on what passage you're in. So, some cases He's like whatever. I don't care what's happening to you. Me to you. Do you deserve what you're getting? Or other times He's actually taking the Babylonian army and crushing his own people for their disobedience and sending them into exile. Okay. The fact that Israel, you know, like Judah winds up more, well, the, the, the 10 tribes just get scattered everywhere. The fact that those things happen don't mean that Yahweh was defeated. In some cases, the, the scripture is very plain that he actually does this to teach people a lesson. And sometimes the lesson is really harsh. 
And so you, you know, you could read that, you know, into, into judges too, because it's the period of the judges and it starts off the cycle of, you know, Israel forgetting Yahweh and then they get oppressed and then they cry out to Yahweh and Yahweh raises up a judge. And then the whole thing repeats itself like eight times in the book. You know, it, it could be one of those too. All right. Well, we're coming up at about an hour right now. Yeah. Let's just uh, ask a uh, one question from Brass. Um, sure. What are your, what are your thoughts on Leviticus 25, uh, 44 to 46, which seems to talk about chattel slavery of foreigners, as well as the so-called sex slavery in ex Exodus 21? <sighs> sex slavery in Exodus 21? It has more to do with the, the Midianite story, I believe. No, no, it's uh, selling your daughter to some as a slave to somebody. Oh, no. Is this from Judges or from Leviticus or what? Where are we going? It was here? from Exodus. And by and, and by the way, I mean we we have time to pick up six and seven uh, on the other list. Uh, if you want to cut that out, edit that out, make a note to yourself. You know, I, I think with a lot of these situations, you get Israelites with their boots on the ground doing things that seem perfectly logical to them, given their culture, as opposed to God sitting there thinking, you know, I can't think of a better solution. So I'm going to demand, I'm going to command you to go out and do this. You know, we have a very flawed assumption that the Bible, let's, let's, these are Torah references. So let's just say the Torah here. We have a very flawed assumption that the Torah endorses a culture. It does not endorse a culture. There is no culture that dropped from heaven from God. And that includes the theocracy of Israel and, and, and what is behind a lot of this Torah stuff. I mean, in the examples you, you know, you give like Deuteronomy, if a man has two wives and he, you know, likes the one and hates the other, you know, about not disowning the firstborn of the, of the woman that he doesn't like. Okay. It, it never tells you go out and create this circumstance, go out, you know, God says, go out and solve your problem this way or do this thing. It, it reports that they do those things. And yes, God doesn't like send lightning bolts and say, you idiots, you know, like, what are you doing? You know, first of all, Again, there are, there are plenty of examples where God has picked a people. He's picked them in second, first, whatever it is, millennium BC. They already have a culture in place. And God is essentially content, whether we like it or not, of using what he's got to work with. Now, we know from biblical theology that the theocracy was not a divinely handed down culture that was supposed to be here from time, for time immemorial. How do we know that? Because biblical theology informs us that what God is really up to is to get humanity back to where it began, back to Eden. And it's about defeating you know, all of the forces of chaos to get things back to Eden. Well, back in Eden, there was no Jew-Gentile distinction. There was no Jewish culture. There was no theocracy. Okay, there, there, there was no subjugation of women. Right? There were none of these things. And we know that that's, that's the, the way the Bible is directing things because of the way the Bible ends with the new heaven and new earth in Edenic terms. And those late chapters in the New Testament draw heavily on the Old Testament. You, you get this stuff in the prophets. The writer of Revelation is not just making stuff up. He's drawing from an Old Testament vision of a new Eden, not a new Israel, not a new theocracy, not a new, you know, something that's smaller than, than Eden or smaller than the, the whole world is supposed to be Eden. This is what God wanted in the first chapter of Genesis. And God is going to have his way. That's the message of biblical theology. Now, along the way, there's going to be lots of bumps. God has to break into history, call a dude named Abraham. Okay, his people are going to do this, that, and the other thing. They're going to do some good stuff. They're going to do some terrible stuff. Okay, his descendants... The Israelites, they are what they are. God made a promise to them that I'm going to use Abraham's seed to, to, to work the plan back to Eden. It's going to take a long time. You know why? Because God chose to have humans be indispensable parts of working back to Eden. 
God's not going to turn everybody into robots. This is why we still have evil. Why do we have evil if God, if there's a God? It's because God at some point, namely at the very beginning, said, I'm going to create beings who are like me. They're going to be my imagers. And I'm going to share my attributes with them so that they can be like me and fulfill their destiny. And what I want them to do is I want them in my family. I want them to be partners in, my, in this world that I have created for them. And I'm going to come to earth and live with them. I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. And we're all going to be here together and enjoy it. There's no deficiency in me as to why I'm doing this. I just like to do it. I like to create things like me. And I want partners and kids. And so I'm going to create beings, humans, who are like me. And when I share my attributes with them, if I take their attributes away, namely human freedom, they're no longer like me. And that isn't the way I want things done. So, yeah, we can get angry at God that there's evil. But you know what? There's evil because God would rather have the fallout, pardon the pun, of that plan than to never have us at all. That is the story of biblical theology. And we make a terrible mistake. Instead of looking at the meta narrative, we zero in on Torah passages and assume that God is endorsing this, you know, whatever the, this, this point of culture is. Israelite culture was planned to be obsolete, it's planned obsolescence. But you're only going to discern that. If you're taking the big picture look, again, the meta narrative, as we like to say. Um, so I, I know that was kind of a long roundabout way of talking about these kinds of passages. But again, I, I think that there's a, there's a big bucket uh, that, that basically a lot of these go into. They are what they are because of, of who the people are. And God is... You know, well, he's he's working with what he has at his disposal, and he's not going to change them. He's not going to say, "Well, I'm I'm going to work with you, but first you got to stop doing this and clean that up." And you know, you know, over here now, once they enter into covenant, then you know, some things are going to be about believing loyalty. You don't do certain things that that other people do when they worship their other gods, because then it becomes about their relationship with him, their exclusive, the exclusivity of that. Most of the time, more broadly speaking, it sort of is what it is. All right, time for two more questions, and then we'll call it a night. You said on your podcast that you plan on doing a follow-up to Unseen Realm. Like, is it going <laughs> to be a more rigorously academic version of the original, which was more aimed at a popular audience and submitted for peer review? You know, I, I've gotten this question now a couple of times in the last week. I, there is no Unseen Realm sequel in progress. Um, I'd like there to be one. <laughs> but, but, but my wish is not corresponding to reality and probably won't for a real long time. Um, I would say when I, when I get into that, um, you know, uh, let me put it this way. I'm not going to repeat Unseen Realm in another book. That's the first thing. Unseen Realm is very well sourced. I mean, it's not all this. I have over 6,000 sources in my Zotero bibliography for all things Divine Council and Unseen Realm. So, of course, I don't put that all in the footnotes, all right? It's quite well sourced in, in terms of peer-reviewed literature. It's not a book for scholars, though, because it's not intended to be. I don't get into source critical questions and parse verbs and do nuts and bolts philology and all that stuff. I let the sources do that. I let the stuff in the footnotes do that. So I'm hoping readers who want more information will go out to the footnotes and go search for that stuff and go find them. And many have, you know, that, and I think that raises the bar for their friends and their churches, which is part of what I hope my work propels. I want people to look beyond my books, which is why I clutter them with data, with footnotes, okay? So I've gone through the material to ferret out the content. I present it hopefully in a decipherable way to non-specialists. And that's what I do. You know, scholars who want more, hey, use a library. You know how to do that because you're a scholar. Right? <laughs> and I would presume that anybody else who cares will, again, do that instead of criticizing something in the book at a distance. Go, go look up the material, you know, and just, I mean, do a do some work. I mean, it just, it, it just takes right. work. So I, I can't reproduce all of that in a book. Um, but I, I'm, 
I try to shoot for, again, I, let me put it this way. I, I literally have over 6,000 references of stuff that I talk about in Unseen Realm or that I would layer you know, onto Unseen Realm content in a subsequent book. I am not hurting for data. And the fact that all that exists tells me that I don't need to produce much more of that. What I need to produce is stuff for the non-specialist. And so that's what I try to do. You know, I, I, I just try to get people a distillation of what scholars talk about. Again, hopefully in a, a readable, decipherable way, and then try to equip them, try to produce something useful for their own study. Are there any projects you have in mind for the future? Like I've heard rumors from our mutual friends at Sensible Apologetics that you are interested in doing an Unseen Realm movie or video game. Tell us about that. And you also said, well, I guess, that you have an Unseen Realm cruise ship coming up. How'd you? Yeah, that that, that's, that's the most real of those three things you mentioned. <laughs> um, the, the Unseen Realm movie. Um, I, I'm not planning one and would never plan one. However, Faith Life, my, my former employer, you know, the, again, they, they make Logos, the Bible software. They have filmed what we loosely called in the building, the, the documentary, even though that isn't in, for my taste. I, I, honestly, I don't know what to call it. So, you know, we, they, they have created a film that is based on the book. It's like a talking head film, you know, with other scholars in it. And and I, am, of course, will be in it. I don't know when they're going to air that. I mean, they, they did one a few years ago called Fragments of Truth. It was about New Testament uh, manuscripts. And that was a Fathom event. So they may be thinking that. I don't know. I mean, that, honestly, nobody tells me. They didn't tell me when I worked for them. They're not telling me now. So, yeah, that exists. But I don't really know what's beyond that um, video game. There have been people who have suggested this uh, to me. Uh, I don't have any skill in that area and don't have any funding for it, but I'll give the idea a thumbs up. Well, that would be cool. Uh, but that's yeah, kind of where, like where these, it's at. <laughs> like Adam and Eve and all these other cavemen and Eden and Yahweh battling Leviathan and all yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, I, what, what I'd like to see happen is, I mean, I, my, my next book coming out, it, it comes out in a few weeks. It's called uh, The World Turned Upside Down. Uh, the subtitle is Finding the Gospel in Stranger Things, okay, the TV show. So what, what I've done in that is I, this is literally what, what my method was. I wrote this, I self-published this little book called What Does God Want? Because I wanted to be able to control the content to give that away in English, in English you know, not in English, because this will sell the English to fund giving it away in other languages, because I have a nonprofit who that is doing that. But I took the content of that book, which is for new believers or seekers, like, okay, what, what does God want? I mean, what, what's the whole point to all of this? And I answer that question. It's, it's a short book. It's very readable. I mean, it's got almost 90 reviews already uh, on, on Amazon. But then I took that and I mapped the meta narrative story I have in that book to Stranger Things. And honestly, it was easy. Stranger Things, I don't know if your audience likes the show or not. I, I love the show. It is good storytelling and it, it captures so well the human condition. The fact that we are as lost as will buyers, we cannot save ourselves. To our, our salvation really focuses on something external and supernatural too. I mean, there's so many big meta narrative things in the show, and I don't think they're doing any of this intentionally. They're not doing Christian stuff intentionally. It's just that good storytelling will map over to good storytelling. And so, what I would love to see happen is I would love to see people create video games. And write other books like the Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, anime, video games, whatever. Map the storytelling elements to the meta narrative of Scripture, the supernatural meta narrative of the Bible. Because I think it would really communicate important theological stuff to a visual audience and to an audience that just, that, that, that all that stuff's going to be a bridge 
to them. It'll, it'll, it'll speak really well. So I've, I've done that with Stranger Things. I'm hoping that will prompt people to try to do the same thing with my content. That'd be awesome. You know, I, I, I hope they do it. Well, it's kind of like what Jordan Pearson suggests about uh, superheroes being yeah, exactly. like, like, like demigods. You know, and I, I, whenever that comes up, I always recommend, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Christopher Nolan, I think. I mean, there are a bunch of Nolans that get confused yeah. here. But he, the, the guy who wrote the book, Our Gods Wear Spandex. And d- don't let the cover um, deceive you. It's it's kind yeah. of a it's a comic book cover, but it's really a good book. And it's, it's about how, um, you know, the superhero universes track on really big um, archetypal religious themes you know and how they convey the same thoughts just in comic book form it's it's quite good and there are a lot of things out there like that but that's to me i think that's one of the more accessible books um so if you're interested in that kind of thing i I highly recommend that book just to get your mind going on what the comic book storylines are are really what they're really tracking on is it's a lot it's a lot bigger you know than you might think um you know i was thinking if the if the Unseen Realm video game gets made, the the loading screen should just be like um, like an animation of of a, a Bronze Age goat herder just hitting an, <laughs> a village atheist over the head with a with a, a club. I thought you were going to say something about one of my pugs there, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I I. I don't know what's going to happen in there. I mean, if for anyone thinking about doing the video game, I'm sure they'd have to get some kind of usage agreement with the publisher, Alexum, you know, I, and I, I can't give that, but I, I, I think it's a great idea. I, I would hope somebody would do it. Oh. All right. We should say something about the cruise. I said, yeah. the cruise is the most real. Um, this was actually my, my wife's idea. Um, she has a friend who was a travel agent. We are going to have a Naked Bible cruise in October of 2020. So if you if your listeners went to Naked Bible Tours, uh, they would find the website for that. Or they could just sign up for my newsletter. We have something in there. But, yeah, it's going to be in the New England uh, and the, and on into you know Canada above the New England states in the fall. So it's going to be awesome. Uh, not in but the that, No, not, not, the, not this one. I mean, this is like a first, like, kind of a trial run for the idea but we see we know lots of people who've gone on cruises and and from what we've heard um i know somebody who's done it and then people who've just attended but the cruises are always looking for uh content experts in just about anything so they can present lectures and and talks during sea time you know because you know it gives other people something to do while they're at sea and so that that was the beginning of her idea with her friend, the travel agent. And this is just what came out. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna take a crack at this. People can on, already sign up for it. I've been on a cruise once. I got sun poisoning. We were at the equator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think that'll happen when this one. But <laughs> no, no. no if, my, if we ever go down, if we ever go down to to the equator, yeah, you know, bring your sunscreen. Stu- I guess my stupid ass went out without sunscreen the first day, and I just. I did everything you know. else except step foot on the, the islands. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going on about an hour, 20 minutes. Um, is that, is all the questions good? Yep. Yeah. You got any final thoughts? Um, no, you know, I actually like this conversation. I think we did get to go through a bunch of details. We got to go through some biblical scholarship and I don't know. I just had a good time with this. Yeah, it was fun. All right. This has been part one of Heiser House. Next time we'll be (laughs) next time we'll be we'll be discussing his other books, uh, Reversing Hermon and Angels, where we will talk about the angels, uh, Lucifer, the old gods, all that good stuff. So stay tuned for that and see you next time.